Praise the Lord. Good morning this morning. Good. I want us to return to our passage of study. Colossians has been our study. And I will really wish we spend a bit of time look, looking at the passage. Look at the context of the text. And then draw the issues that I sense the Lord is bringing to us more deliberately. Can we take Colossians chapter 1? When you have time, let me suggest that you will spend a bit of time to read Colossians. It's only about four chapters, but such a very, very great, great book that anyone who wants to walk victoriously with the Lord and who would like to move in the reality of the resurrection of Christ, this is a very important book to study. But for us, there is a focus that the Lord is giving, which I wish we can trace and bring out deliberately as we again pray together this morning. We read up to verse 19 yesterday, but I would like to take it verse 20 down to 29. <clears throat> verse 20 to 29 will be our text for study. And in this verse 20 to 29, there are two segments that we could divide it into. And the two segments will mark the two prerequisite things that must happen to every man who will be part of what God wants to do in the end time. When uh, a sister was bringing the word, I was talking about the temple and that the greatest contender in the temple that is always setting up merchandise against the glory of God is not Satan. It's not Satan. Satan, yes, opposes the purpose of God. But Satan is a very small thing because you see, the Bible says, stand up against the devil, he will turn and run. Is that not what the Bible says? It said, resist the devil, and he will do what? And he will flee. Which means Satan can flee. But then there is an enemy within that usually opens the door for the enemy outside. The enemy within that weakens a man from inside and makes him a piece of bread. That enemy within that has reduced the impact of several men that would have been great for God, self strangulated them. Self, finish them from inside. Self, reduced them onto a piece of bread. And they only died a shadow of what they could have become. I noticed that in these Colossians, the Holy Spirit was pointing at something there which I would like us to quickly look, those two segments are very critical. From verse 20, 
down to verse 23 will be the first segment. And 24 down to 29 will be the second segment. If God helps me and we're able to get through this first segment this morning, then the night we might begin to focus on the second critical segment. The two must go concurrently. If we stop with first segment, we might rejoice. But it will be, it will not be complete. It will stop us halfway. So the two sides must be taken in hand together. It's only that we need to particularly ensure that the first segment, which is the prerequisite for the second, actually takes place. So let's turn together and look at Colossians chapter 1. And I'd like to read together with us verse 20. 21, 22, 23. I'll read it up to 23 for the first point and then we'll come back later. And you who once were alienated and hostile in mind doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. If indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you had, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, became a minister. In that few Bible verses, there's a lot, a lot that I felt God should give us liberty to deal with uh, particularly. So that what God is saying to us, what God is promising us, as individuals and as a family and as the church of God and as the nation can find expression. Can find expression. I want us to repeat that passage steadily as we go little by little. Verse 20. And by him to reconcile all things to himself by him, whether they be things on earth or things in heaven, and having made peace through the blood of his cross, and you who once were alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he has now what reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy, blameless, and above reproach in his sight. If indeed you continue in the faith, grounded and steadfast, and are not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you have had, which was preached to every creature under heaven, of which I, Paul, have become a minister. Yesterday we were looking at Christ. We are looking at the supremacy of Christ. We are looking at the centrality of Christ. We are looking at Christ as God's answer to mankind. We are looking at Christ 
who qualified us to become partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. In whom the Bible says we have redemption. Even the forgiveness of sins. And we noted that if there was no forgiveness of sins, we would be completely hopeless. But there's something more that I see Colossians building into, which I wish, let's talk about it as we study the Bible this morning. Forgiveness of sins by the blood of Jesus is, is a great, is a great, it's a great thing. I noted yesterday that unless we have come to experience God's forgiveness of our sins, everything else that we may want to invest, we will not do it. Nothing else. I've seen people who became philanthropists simply because they are looking for forgiveness of their own past. Can you imagine? They have spoiled so many lives. They have damaged so many people. And they have now come under the, under the guilt of their past sins. And they are thinking, what can I do to be forgiven? So they want to sell the whole estate. They want to go everywhere. Doing that as if it can undo what they did before. No. Even philanthropy cannot secure the forgiveness of our sins. The truth is that that which you do now does not undo what you did before. It is only in Christ Jesus that we have redemption. And because the blood of bulls and the blood of animals cannot, they are completely inadequate in cleansing sin. Very inadequate. Thousands and thousands of bulls shed cannot take away one single blot of sin. I told you that sin, the way sin is, if you understand the power of sin, sin creeps into your life in five minutes, but it sticks to your memory for 50 years. Let me tell you, you can forget your certificate. You can forget other things, but you can't forget your sin. That's the power of sin. When sin comes to a man's life, it becomes a permanent stain. Nothing takes it away. People pay so heavily, if they could be released from the memory of their sinfulness, Impossible. Impossible. People, they make great sacrifices. Some even decide, since I have misbehaved so much, let me die, let me kill myself. If that will please God, no. Even when a man out of remorse offered himself to be slaughtered. He still did not obliterate the sin he has committed. Friends, what can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can 
Make me whole again. Oh, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as no, no other found. I know nothing but the blood of Jesus. Nothing. Nothing. This is what makes Christ unique. That's what makes Christ incomparable. That's what makes nothing to substitute the way of our faith. This is why the entire world will lie under the weight of the evil one until they come to Jesus. Because no one else has the wherewithal to wash away the sin and the sins that we have committed. So, how great it is that we have redemption and forgiveness of our sins in him because of the blood that is shed at Calvary. Brothers and sisters, when we talk about the blood of Jesus, we're not talking of a small thing. It's not a slogan. It's not a mere doctrine. It is the basis of our communion. Say, without the shedding of blood, there can be no remission of sins. Friends, what it means is this. If there is no remission, if there is no shedding of the blood, the blood of the Lamb, permanently, forever, your sin will stand before you. And every time you want to approach God, God says, get him out of here. I am of a purer eyes. I cannot behold iniquity. But when Jesus offered the blood, and in this scripture he said, the blood of his cross, the blood that, that, that flowed as it was pierced. And as the blood was flowing, the only thing the devil dreaded was beginning to happen. The reason, may I tell you, the reason why the devil tempts every man with sin is because he knew from his experience the power of iniquity. Please hear me very well. This is very important because the things that Jesus did, the things that are the fundamentals of our faith need to be restated again if we are going to experience the kind of revival we are looking for. I just realized that the content of the gospel had been so watered that even though we gather people, they are singing, but they simply don't just know what they believe. They just don't know. They think we are just gathering because we just are gathering some good people. No. That's not it. And that's why they are saying, hey, uh, you see, why are you so intolerant? Why can't you include everybody? Why can't we have people of all faiths? We can't have people of all faiths. We are not being intolerant. We are just being true. We are not just being greedy. We are not greedy at all. We are only telling the truth. This is the incontrovertible truth. This is the truth that cannot be exchanged for anything else. 
Hallelujah. The devil knew. Do you know that Lucifer, he was one of the covering cherub. That is to tell you now, in the hierarchies of the archangels, Lucifer came first. The perfection of beauty was found in him. The Bible described him as having seven heads. That's to say, he is perfection of intelligence. And it was that cherub that stood before the Shekinah glory that covered the glory. And he was so beloved, according to scripture, until iniquity was found in him. And once iniquity was found in him, he had no place again in the presence of God. Iniquity dislocates a man. No matter how highly placed you are, even in the work of God, iniquity will do what? We dislocate you and bring you to nothing. Sin. S-I-N. A three-letter word. It's one word that have destroyed the whole world. It destroyed marriages. It destroyed ministries. It destroyed pastors and preachers. It rendered them to become nothing. Sin. And so the devil knew. Maybe you are the one who didn't know the potency of sin. The devil knew it. The devil knew that there's nothing else you can do to a man and you will have damaged him apart from putting sin in his life. The devil knows that. So when Lucifer found himself cast out, he became homeless. Honestly speaking, do you know, in the mind, the purpose of God, he wasn't meant to be here. He was sent to the bottomless pit. But on his way down, he said, let me make an attempt. Whether man will be deceived into the kind of thing that has damaged me. You know why the devil cannot be reconciled? There was no blood for him. There's no blood for him. There was nothing the devil can present or any of the demons can present that will make God overlook their iniquity. No way. It's unfortunate. But thank God that for me and for you, there is the blood of the Lamb. There is the blood of the Lamb. That blood, the blood that flowed from Emmanuel's vein at Calvary, the blood that broke forth out of his cross. The blood, the power of the blood is that it has capacity to blot out every stain. Sister, do you know the great, the great thing is that the blood sprinkled upon your life takes Every blight, every spot, every blemish of sin, it takes it out neat without leaving a scar. So all those who have come under the blood, Satan looks at them and says, 
So you will find acceptance again. I'm permanently and forever rejected. So you mean you will be forgiven again. Simply because you believe this man of Calvary. It's something we cannot talk about. We cannot over talk about. It's invaluable. The blood of the Lamb. And can I tell you something about the blood? Is that the Bible says. If we say. We are fellowship with him. And we walk in darkness. We lie. There's no truth in us. That's what First John chapter 1 verse 6 says, isn't it? But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of his son cleanses us from all sin. Now, the blood does not just walk once when you repented. You understand? When you gave your life to Christ, or when you repented, the blood washed. But the blood didn't stop there. To sustain fellowship with God, to sustain continuous unbroken relationship with God, the blood keeps dripping. The blood cleanses from all unrighteousness. From all unrighteousness. How I wish you will walk away from your own guilt and come under the blood. May I say to you, yes, your sins could be great. Yes, you have gone far. That's okay. It's true that you went far. It's true that the devil took advantage of your life. But there's something greater than the devil. The blood of the Lamb. The blood. That you are not forgiven is not because the blood is not flowing, but that you are too arrogant to come under the blood. Excuse me. Whosoever humbles himself and comes under the blood shall be cleansed. You will be wondering why thousands of people have not looked towards the blood. You will wonder why people prefer to struggle than to come under the shower of the blood of the Lamb. You wonder why people like to give excuses for their misbehavior rather than come with penitence and say, Lord, I banged it. I misbehaved. But I'm coming. I'm coming. There's no righteousness of mine. But I come under the blood. And God said, yes. For a man like you. It was not angels that he came to help. That's what Hebrews chapter 2 says. How many of you know that Jesus did not come to help angels? Eh? Angels cannot be helped. Angels have no second chance. If anybody was an angel here, he should please excuse us. <laughs> and sorry. But he came to help the seed of Abraham. Men that carry flesh and blood. Such that when they come under the blood, God says, when I see the blood, I will bypass. I will overlook. I will look away. And I will accept you. Again this morning. You do not, let me inform you, it is not humility to keep the treasure, to keep the trash of your sin as if it's a treasure. Excuse me? It is not humility 
That every time you come, you think that all oh, that matters are how you say, Oh God, you know. <laughs> oh God. It's not humility. It's not humility to trust in tears than in the blood. It's not humility. It is not humility. To depend on hard work than to come under the blood. And it is not anything called consecration to repose confidence in self discipline, bodily treatment. As if, if we lacerate our bodies and we keep it under serious, strict discipline, it will avail to obliterate one sin. No. No. All of that, I would say to you, is an insult. In fact, it provokes God more. Because you seem to be saying that you have discovered another means that is sufficient for God to have overlooked your iniquity and is not by the blood. How many people are sitting here today and the body, the body in your life is that of self-righteousness? You see, it's difficult. It's difficult when I'm talking. Some of you by the grace of God, you want to live the life of holiness, isn't it? And so you have come into that legalistic holiness. That things, that there's something that you can climb upon to enter into the presence of God. And it may be your prayer life. Excuse me. We will talk about praying. Prayer is great, but prayer does not forgive sin. Prayer does not cleanse a man from sin. Otherwise, Muslims pray more than you. If it is prayer, we should have recommended 21 day fasting every month so as to keep yourself cleansed. But sorry, even fasting and prayer has no capacity to take away the least of our iniquity. It's only the blood of his cross. It's only the blood of his cross. And I want to say again, as I pass on from there, because that is fundamental. Fundamental for you to walk with God. Fundamental for you to have an unbroken relationship with God. It's fundamental to walk into God's presence with boldness. He said, he said the Bible said, therefore let us come with boldness into the holies of all, assured, having sprinkled our conscience, you remember that? Having been washed by the blood, then we can come. Can I say to you, I come into his presence, not because I'm a preacher. You know, sometimes as preachers, something deceives a preacher to think since I'm the one preaching the word of God, since I'm the one leading others to Christ, since I'm the one bringing the truth, since I'm the one exposing the Bible, God should at least respect me and admit me into his presence based on the ministry I'm discharging. Terrible mistake. Now, you, you, you don't understand, maybe because you are not a preacher, Ah, you don't know. You don't know that sometimes preachers, 
they are quietly, quietly breaking their consecration. But they still have confidence to go and preach because something tells them, you are too precious to God. He can't just throw you away. How can he throw you away with this great ministry that you are doing? Many people are already blessed with your ministry. Even if you are misbehaving, he will not throw you away. No. Excuse me, it's not ministry. That commends us to God is the blood. Every preacher, no matter how high you are preaching life, you must be humble enough every day to come under the blood. Because that's the only means by which God can relate with you. It's the only interface between the divine God and the human being that we are. Without the blood, no communion, no communication. How I wish I could stretch this, that entering to the presence of God every day is only by the blood. It's by the blood. Now, am I asking you to be careless? Am I saying go as many times to come and sin anyhow? Just come under the blood and take a shower. Is that what I'm saying? No. That's not what I'm saying. And those who cherish their work with God, they don't play with sin. Do they play with sin? Somebody asked me, I said, since the Bible says uh, the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all unrighteousness, why should we stop sinning? And I looked and said, well, how can I answer this man's question? And I asked him a question. And he said, no, I don't want that. I don't want that. I said, okay. What was the question? I said, there is a very, very, very well-equipped hospital in this city. Well-equipped. And as a citizen, you even have already paid insurance that gives you free medical treatment, you, your wife, and at least four of your family members. The bed in the hospital sometimes is far, far, far better than the bed in your house. Am I right? When you are admitted in the hospital, you have the benefit of the services, not only of the nurses, but even of the people that cook. They come take order. Say, what would you like to eat this afternoon? And you take, you take, you take, you take. Now, is there any day you woke up and say, Father, since this hospital has been established here with this great facility, when will I have opportunity to be admitted there? Lord, please, please, let me get admitted in the hospital. How many of you prayed for that? Eh? Because there's hospital facility, you want to be sick? Talk to me. That's it. That is it. I write unto you that you sin not. But if any man sins, we have an advocate. We have an hospital. The fact that there is a provision in case in case you went down does not make going down your first choice. Is going to hospital your first choice? You see, because my wife was a medical doctor and in the hospital where she worked, she highly loved and we had free medical care. All my children, all ourselves, everyone. And you know, it's part of the, what they call, uh, is it a benefit? And every year, when my wife is filling out her claims, 
Medical expenses, zero. You know why? I live on divine health. I live on divine healing. God, by his stripes, healed me. Long ago, I lived like that. And she walked for years. And I had no chance, oh my God, to take an injection. <laughs> ah! I said, oh, these people have cheated me. They have cheated me. <laughs> and the question I was asking is, ah! so, so should God withdraw your divine health? So that you have the privilege of claiming your benefit. I said, Lord, no, 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 no. You see, we have children that never used the benefit. Because if anything happened to them, you just say, Father, in the name of Jesus, Karibo Shandorobo Skimbarabashir, get out of that place. And the girl gets healed and begins to walk about. And that we don't pay a dime for it. Because of the man of Calvary. Because he went to Calvary. He died there. What a privilege. What a privilege. The world system cannot understand what we are talking about. They don't know what is death brought to us. And what the blood of the Lamb released unto us when we have redemption in Him. So we have the blood of the Lamb cleanses. What I understand with that cleansing is that, you know, it's a regular. It's a regular process. It just, it just, it, yeah. Did you take your bath this morning? Eh? You took your bath. Is it because you were sick? It's just correct to take your bath. It's just good to go under shower. And just be there and be fresh. God provides the blood as the shower. To keep me fresh. To keep me acceptable. That every time I come, God looks at the blood and says, Good, come in, come in. Let's fellowship together. That blood that was shared at Calvary was to make communion with God possible. So look at that verse 20. Verse 20 now says, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace. By what? By the blood of his cross. The blood of of his cross was to bring reconciliation. A restoration of relationship. A restoration of fellowship. Now, take note, there is no other religion in all the earth that has a correct understanding of the blood. Excuse me. Even when we were coming from traditional religion and there was a lot and lot and lot of blood sacrifices, sacrifices of animals and all of this. And even when we came to the point where cuttings were made in our bodies for our blood to be put on what they want to make together as concussion, it still didn't bring deliverance. Because that's not the blood. Tell somebody, your blood is not the blood. Shedding it is a waste. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. If you shed your blood, it's a waste. Because it's not the blood. It's not the blood. The blood that cleanses from all unrighteousness is the blood 
of the sinless Son of God, the Lamb of God, who take away the sins of the whole world. What was the blood? It was for reconciliation. It said to reconcile all things to himself, whether things in heaven or things on earth. I was touched when I read the Bible. It said, even the tabernacle in the heavenlies had to be cleansed by the blood. When Moses had finished doing everything he was told to do according to the pattern he saw, he was dealing with the photocopies. Even before anybody could use it, it had to be what? Sanctified, sprinkled by the blood before anybody could use it. The Bible now says, if the earthly tabernacle had to be sanctified by the shedding of blood, how much more the heavenly tabernacle needs a better blood. So friends, let me inform you now. The blood of Jesus is not only sufficient to deal with my sins, it is a requirement, is a prerequisite, even for the heavenly things to be sanctified. So there is no other who provided such, who has such a provision. If you ask me, why are you a Christian, Bragbile? Is because there's nothing else to be. Everything else is unreasonable. And I want to tell you, without, I'm not, you know, please again, don't think I'm just being intolerant. No man who has not come to Jesus has hope. No man. The reason is that everything else that they could gather around themselves as possible hope they have already failed the blood tests. You know, sometimes you have some uncles who are very nice. I say, my uncle is very nice. He's the one that sponsored me in school. A very, very nice man. Very, 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 very very, very, I don't know very, very, very you want to say. <laughs> you are looking for all the appellation you want to give him. He's a great giver. In fact, he donated a church in our village. All of that. But he never submitted to the great sacrifice, the blood of the Lamb. He thought that good works will save him. Sorry. Even things that were never contaminated in the manner of the earth are still not acceptable, even in heaven, until they were sanctified by the blood of Jesus. Any man who has not come under the blood of the Lamb, honestly speaking, nothing about him is acceptable. The reason why I'm laying this before you is because when we get to the second segment where Paul say it is for this that I became a minister. I want God to help you see the imperative of preaching the gospel. The truth is that without the gospel men will perish. Your uncle that has not believed the gospel has to come under the blood of the lamb has no hope. It's not that we are not kind to him. We are kind. It's not that we are not gentle with him. We are gentle. It's not because we don't love him. We love him. But the truth of the matter is that presently as he is, he does not have what it takes to see the glory of God. The blood of his cross was shed to reconcile how many things? All things. 
whether they are on earth or in heaven. Are we together? But now, you know the trouble. Can I tell you the trouble? Anybody who has lived on earth before, are you hearing me? Has to be reconciled on earth. Not when he gets to heaven. Oh, am I confusing you? You are not hearing me at all. All those who have lived on earth, it is on earth that they must be reconciled by the blood of the Lamb. There will be no reconciliation when they cross from here and they go into the heavenlies. No. Maybe if they have never come to the earth and they have always been in the heavens and the blood will reconcile them up there. But if you have lived here on earth, even for a few days, you have to be reconciled here. Is that making sense? But can I ask you, so what does it cost? The price is paid. The blood was shed. Everything is ready. All he simply asks you to do is say, come. Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy lady, I'll give you rest. Come. Sometimes you think that, oh, God is holding a big stick. And that if you come, he will say, hey, yeah, 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 I catch you today. I catch you now. You did this, 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 you did this. How can you go? Now, what a faulty thinking. Can I tell you how faulty it is? Do you know? Do you know? That even when you didn't come, his hands is, in, is long enough to capture you where you are. Are you hearing me? Why you were there, thinking that nobody sees you, brother David said, even if I went under the sea, there you will catch me. Where can I go and I will hide myself from you? Now, if he who has capacity to have captured you and take you and say, I caught you. If he put, he, he waited and you came. Is that the time he will jump and say, now I catch you? No. That is the misunderstanding of the sinner. The sinner thinks that when you come to God now, he will just catch you and, uh, 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 and punish you. No. When he calls you and says, come, it's because he's already ready to forgive you. It's because the blood was already available to cleanse you. You have no excuse not to be saved. You have no excuse to be lost. You have no excuse not to be in the kingdom of God. And through him to reconcile to himself all things. Whether on earth or in heaven. Making peace by the blood of his cross. Do you understand that? Do you understand that? So friends. Why is Jesus supreme? It's because he is the only one that has what it takes to reconcile us back to God. Why should we preach the gospel to every young man? It's because outside the gospel, that man, as intelligent as he is, will be lost. Why should we confront every man with the word of God? Especially the man of Calvary who died. It's because every other thing that man can do 
will continuously be inadequate for what God wants to do for his life. Are we together? Eh? If you are sitting here and you have come to know Jesus, then I want to again say to you, that which you have got, hold it how fast. Because there's no other alternative. No other way. No other place. Christ is not one of those prophets. Many, many great prophets, but none of them shed their blood. And even if they did, it's not the blood. It's not the blood. It wasn't the blood. But now, there was one more issue that Jesus went ahead to deal with. And I suppose that if God gives us help now and we can bring it forth within this time of study, then we can be ready for the second segment, which I'm trusting we can deal with when we come back in the night. Now, look now at verse 21. Verse 21, 22 is very technical. Very technical passage. And one of the things that my heart has been yearning and praying about was the kind of help that men like Paul received to state the word of God so accurately. All preachers that are here, you need to pray for that. Sometimes we are on the pulpit, we rattle and talk so many things that has no relevance in saving souls. Some of us, we preach what I can easily call synagogue sermons. What you are saying, excuse me, even if we carry it into a psychologic, a psychology class, it will disturb nobody. Because you are just speaking motivation. To come and say, yeah, hallelujah, you're going to be great. There's nothing peculiar about that. That's not the gospel. Not the gospel. That's not the gospel. Doesn't make anything peculiar. If you came and told somebody, take heart, take heart. All is not lost. That can be said in a mosque. <laughs> Makes no difference. So you see, when we begin to bombard our churches with things that is no different from what a psychologist will say or a Muslim imam will say. We are producing a people that are not distinct. We are raising a congregation that can easily fuse into the world because there's nothing new about what we are saying to them. It's not distinct. But look. Look at Paul. Speaking things that we cannot but emphasize. We are going to produce people who are peculiar. People who are bold. People who are not intimidated. People whom you don't need to be casting out their demons every week. Some of you are going to churches where they do deliverance every week. And it's not that they are talking to new people. It's the same set of people that came last week. <laughs> deliverance hour is every week. And I'm asking a question. If they were delivered last week, why did you expect them again this week? 
Unfortunately, you see, if any of them did not attend the deliverance hour, you ask him, why didn't we see you? Why didn't we see you? He said, well, last week when I came, I was delivered. I thank God. I didn't need to. He said, no, no, keep coming. Keep coming. Keep coming. What's the meaning of that? That was the same ministry of the Levites. Because every week people came with burnt offerings and sin offerings. That's where the man of God got food. So how will he ever pray that they will be delivered from coming? No! They did it regularly because it has become a profession. Nobody was looking forward to their deliverance. No! Honestly, they should not be delivered so that we can keep having ministry. No. If we are going to raise people who live victoriously, who could look at the devil in his face and get, get out of that place, they have known the blood. So the devil can't accuse them. They can tell the devil, say, look, my sins and all the things you want to use to accuse me, blotted out blotted out cleansed go and bring your, your archives see whether there's anything there you'll find that is blank the devil said this one knows let's leave him alone this one mm -mm -mm -mm. he has known the truth leave this one alone it's not the kind we can press in the middle of the night. I had a dream. Hey, 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 I have a dream. They are pressing me. Oh, hey, hey. No. This one says, where I am, you cannot come. Because I've been translated into the kingdom of his dear son. Now, verse 21, 22 now raises another fundamental issue. And what is this? And you, who were once alienated and hostile, but the word hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death. You know, we talked about the blood of his cross. Am I right? But now we are coming to something which is a component for our deliverance. For us to raise men and women who walk in victory. He now says, look at this. Please take time to read 21, 22. I say it's technical. You could rush it without understanding what is there. And you, who once were alienated. What's the meaning of alienated? What does it mean to be alienated? Separated. Mm. Eh? As, as what? Estranged. Denied access. You know? cast aside and made impossible to be part of. That's what it means to alienate. Now, the Bible says those of us who once were alienated and made hostile in mind, but the New King James says you who once were alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works. Yet now he has reconciled. Can somebody read that for me from the Old King James Bible or NIV before we go away? Yes. And you, you sometimes sometime were alienated and enemies, and enemies. Now, this is very important. Where are they enemies? In the mind. So the enmity between God and ourselves 
is not on our face. Sometimes we spend too much time preaching about facial conversion. Sometimes we spend a lot of emphasis dealing with external conformity. External holiness. Sometimes we, we place great emphasis on the, on, the, on the appearance. As if that was where the enmity is located. You are not God's enemy because of the way you look. And honestly speaking, the way you looked, even if it was so rough and bad, it was because of the enemy where? Inside. Do you get what I'm talking about? So when Jesus was going to reconcile those of us that were sometimes alienated from God, he did not waste time on a beauty the outside. Because it was clear to him that the enmity is not located outside. Where were they enemies? In the mind. So you see, the enemy that had to be crushed in order for there to be a reconciliation to bring me back and become friend with God so that me and God can walk together daily without break. The enemy that is located where? Inside must be dealt with. Oh, brothers, sisters, are you following me? Are you following this? Now, the Bible says, How will he handle the enemy within? Please read. Read the Old King James further. By wicked works. Yes. Uh -huh. In the body of his blessed death. Yeah. To present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. Okay. Okay. Can we check if Amplified Bible could help us? Is there any amplified version here? Thank you to read. 21. And although you at one time were estranged and alienated from him and were of hostile attitude of mind in your wicked activities, yet now has Christ the Messiah reconciled you to God in the body of his flesh through death in order to present you holy and faultless and irreproachable in his the father's presence thank you thank you we take it step by step let's take it step by step what is it that made us hostile to god where was it is the enemy within if we want to catch a bit of that let someone go with us to Ephesians. Let's check the complement of this verse in Ephesians. And sometimes when you are studying Colossians, the twin, the twin epistle eh, is Ephesians. Ephesians and Colossians, they are twins. You will see much of it repeated. But you see, the repetition was necessary because of context. So let's go to Ephesians and see how Ephesians was putting that same uh, instruction. It might be clear to us. Go to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 14 and verse 15. 
verse 16. Yes. For he himself is our peace. Who has made us both one. And has broken down. Where has he broken down the dividing wall of hostility? Where has he broken it down? In his flesh. Please read that verse 14 again. For he himself is our peace. Who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh. The dividing wall of hostility. It doesn't look clear to you yet. Okay, let's check other versions. Who is carrying NIV? New International Version. You want to try? NIV, quickly. Verse 14. Just do quick. And if you have Old King James, get ready for us. For he himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commandments and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace, and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross, by which he put to death their hostility. Okay. Thank you. Where is the King James? For he is our peace, who hath made both one, and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace, and that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. Praise the Lord. These are technical passages. What's technical about it? That the hostility that stood between us and God and between us and people, where is it located? It's in our mind. And how was Jesus going to abolish that hostility? He was going to abolish it in his flesh by the cross. Are we together now? So, the enmity, the hostility, what makes us unable to walk with God is not outside us. Where is it? It's inside. That thing that each time you want to rise up to do something for God, it rises inside of you and say, you cannot do that. If I give you a very quick illustration, you will see. You know, there are times when you did not intend to fast. Eh? But because you are very busy, you might not even have time to take your breakfast until, say, 10 a.m. or even 11 or even 12. Am I right? But if Yesterday night, you decided and said, I'm going to wait on the Lord today. When will you start feeling hungry? <laughs> eh? From 6 a.m. You will hear something inside of you saying, look, you see, what do you, you, you may like, you, you will have also, also. You need just to take something. Just take something. You see, you don't have, you be careful, be careful. Even if you are not going to eat a heavy meal, just take something. Take something light. Just drink something. Just make a very thick cup of tea. <laughs> and a piece of biscuit. Then you can go on. You see? But when you did not intend to fast, the flesh did not oppose it. 
But the day, the moment you decide, I want to do something for God, something inside of you is by law, rises immediately to oppose it. Do you understand what I'm saying? Can you imagine that sometime your husband said something? Something. Anybody could say that. In fact, others said it. It didn't mean much to you. Are you getting me? But now, when he said it, Something inside of you say, what does he mean? Why did he have to talk to me like that? What is he thinking about? Is it because I'm quiet? That's why he's taking me for granted. Ah, I can't understand this. Where is that discussion taking place? Inside, inside. Sometimes you say, I will not talk. Because I don't want problem. And you go and lie down in the room. Were you able to sleep? Did you notice that the man inside said, but what kind of nonsense is this? <laughs> How long will you bear with this kind of thing? <laughs> I can't. So you are lying down in the room. When your husband came in, and just open the door. Are you understanding? I don't know how you can open the door and it will not make a little noise, isn't it? And I say, just open it. Say, who is this that's disturbing somebody here? Can't somebody sleep in his room? What's the meaning of this? Where was this coming from? The man inside. The flesh. Who does everything contrary to the spirit. Every marriage that broke down, it is the flesh that broke it. Just think about it. There was nothing your, your wife did that was outrageous. That you could not have taken out. But sometimes I say, No, I have been keeping quiet for 10 years. <laughs> enough is what? It's enough. We've I've got we've got to settle this issue now. <laughs> Says, so kiss me. We need to decide who is the husband in this house. That's what I'm asking you. Let's decide. I'm not going to talk more than that. It's finished. Then you go into short wave communication. You know short wave communication? Good morning, good morning. <laughs> Where are you going? There. <laughs> when are you coming back? Mm. <laughs> what would you like to eat? Anything. <laughs> short wave. Short wave. You're in the house. Instead of opening your mouth to talk, you text. <laughs> short wave, short wave. Because something inside, the enmity inside, is saying, if you talk now, she would think that you are begging. There is a reason why you should smile. Something you want to smile. But something say, if you smile now, she would think that uh, the matter is finished. So you do your face and... Even though you want to smile, you quickly run into the toilet. <laughs> you smile. You deliberately decided to look tough. Where is this matter coming from? The man is. That's the hostility. That's where the issues have been. Now, for Jesus to do a complete work of our deliverance, for us to be able to walk with God so that he might be able to present us irreprovable before God. He had to do something with the 
hostility inside. That's what we call the flesh. Whereas the blood of Jesus cleanses from all our sins. Every misbehavior we have, we have committed, the blood cleanses. But you see, the blood does not stop the enmity, the man inside who is the producer of all the wrong behaviors. You get what I'm talking about? The man inside is the one that produces all the anger. He's the one that produces all the bad manners. He's the one that makes you to have insatiable desire for sin. Even though the blood of Jesus will cleanse you from every sins that you have committed, yet the blood cannot stop the producer from producing again. And so Jesus said, while I provide the blood for fellowship, for cleansing, for restoration, I need to provide by my death a solution to the hostility inside. Mr. Flesh. And unless the flesh was crucified and brought down, you will not make much progress. Your Christianity will be up, down, up, down, up, down. Today you are alright. Just when you think you are alright, the enemy inside, you will just wake up. And you are surprised. Why was I like this? Is the man inside. He doesn't respect you as a preacher. He doesn't. He doesn't. Sometimes I say, but I'm a preacher. How can I, how can I, how can I fight? So, you might, you might close yourself in because you are, you are, you are protecting a reputation. But the moment you go to where nobody sees you, what happens? The man is, I say, now, after all, nobody is here. Can we operate? It is the man that makes men hypocrites. The man inside. is the hostility. is the enemy inside. How was going, Jesus going to abolish it? You know the word that we introduced here now was abolish. What's the meaning of abolish? To eradicate. To exterminate it. To uproot it. To kill the enemy. The only way by which Jesus was going to do that, the Bible says, it was by his death. So when Jesus agreed to go to Calvary, there was something he was carrying to Calvary. He was carrying the hostility that dwells in my mind. He was taking it to Calvary to nail it there. So that inside here, there's an evacuation of the man that made you the angry man that you used to be for years. You see, for years, you could be nice until your anger comes. You are nice in everything. In fact, you tell people, say, look. Look. There's nothing I cannot, I cannot give up on. But, I could be as gentle as a lamb. But be careful. Don't, don't cross the boundary. I can be a lion. And if you want to take my gentility for stupidity, you will know. I'm gentle, but I'm not stupid. I just want you to know that. I'm a Christian. Eh? I'm a Christian. But I'm not foolish. Let's leave at that. We can be friends. If you play it cool. Who is talking there? That man inside. 
unless it is abolished, you can't go far. And the only person that could do it is Jesus who by his death abolished the enmity between me and God. This afternoon or this morning before we call on God together. As we look at Colossians, we are looking at Jesus because the second segment I'll be bringing the night is only possible when this has taken place. I can imagine how you struggled, how you fasted, how you prayed. Certain habits that that enemy inside keeps bringing out. You did everything to stop it. But it cannot be stopped unless death has taken place. If you ask me, why did Jesus go to the cross? He went to the cross to abolish that man inside. This is what made Christ unique. Every other religion, listen to me, has no theology of the cross. All of them had explanation of how to suffer how to go through purgatory and all of those kind of things. None of them understood that at the cross an exchange took place where Jesus took away the enemy here. Baba, the enemy here is not on your face. Some of us we have been able to subdue the face through years, years of coaching. A Christian should dress like this. A Christian should do like this. A Christian should go like this. A Christian should do like You know, and you have gone through all of that. But it has nothing to do with the man inside. The man inside is not touched by all those regulations. If it was those regulations, ah, there are people that did that better. The Pharisees, they washed. Do you know the Pharisee, if he wants to drink water from the cup, he washed it, he washed his hand, he washed everything, he washed the outside of the cover. But inside, was a sepulcher with dead bones. Friends, what makes Jesus unique <clears throat> is that he is the only one who donated himself to take upon him so as to abolish in his body. Are you hearing me? The enemy that dwells in us. And thereby bringing a continuous permanent reconciliation between us and God. Whereby the enemy inside is now out. It's now killed, abolished when he went to Calvary. So when we talk about the robber inside, when we talk about the man that is buying and selling inside, the one that continues to oppose the move of God inside, where is the solution to it? It's because of Jesus who went to the cross. And I want to say to you, if he went to the cross to abolish, to bring to a decisive end the enemy within, that he might create in himself one new man. One new man, the new man, the new Christian man. So that through the cross, the flesh that has been the undoing of mankind can be brought out. 
so that those who come to him, those who are baptizing to him, they are baptizing to the death in which he died, such that by that single death, we became released, complete, evacuated from the enemy that has walked and walked and walked for years. If any anointing was spoiled, it is the enemy inside. If ministries were bastardized, it's the enemy inside. If the church became carnal, it is because the flesh was not dead with. Am I communicating? Now this, Jesus Christ went to Calvary to finish, to abolish. So Colossians 1, verse 23, now says, that verse 22 yet, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy, blameless, and above reproach before him. Holiness of life is only possible when this abolishing has taken place. And this is what the cross of Jesus Christ actually accomplished. So when we ask men, I can imagine many people preach the gospel that has no cross inside. I can imagine how you call people and say, just come. If you want to be blessed, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Jesus loves you. Just say, Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. It won't work. You can gather a crowd. But that's not a crowd for heaven. What some of you don't understand is that it is not only church that gathers crowd. Did you see football gathering crowd? Eh? Oh, you are not understanding? Did you see that a football, football game gathers crowd? They even pay. To go and watch. So that you gather me a crowd that is not touched from inside. It's not an achievement. It's not a big achievement. Do you know that if a popular singer comes to town, the young people will be falling over to come. Am I right? So, do you know that if we set up a drama here and they said there is a new release, do you know that the crowd will be much? Am I right? Yeah. So, if it's about gathering crowd, we don't even need to do too many things to gather crowd. But if we are preparing men for heaven, the enmity between them and God is inside. It has to be abolished by the cross. If it's not done, we may relate with people for 20 years. The day they will pull a surprise, you'll be surprised. You will just do something. Ah, can he do it? What can he not do? What can the enemy inside not do? can do anything. He's an enemy who is sitting inside calculating every opportunity to strike. And so Jesus came not only to shed the blood. You can see the blood so great, so powerful. If it's only the blood that we needed from Jesus, when they gave him 39 stripes and the blood gushed out, it should have been enough. Was it not enough? Do you know that Pilate actually beat Jesus 39 stripes because he was trying to do what? To avoid him going to death. He said, I have not found anything worthy of death in this man. But let me beat him 39 stripes and release him to you. He was thinking 39 stripes would be sufficient. But may I inform you, 39 stripes brought our blood. 
the blood of cleansing. He pierces his body and releases the water which is meant for our healing. But you see, you can have bodily healing without dealing with the enemy inside. So sometimes, you know, we, we deal with the peripheral issues and don't get to the man inside. If we don't get to the man inside, friends, we will do everything externally. The enemy inside will destroy it after all. And if God is talking about donkeys that he wants to ride, if God is talking about men that he will use to bring glory, I must tell you frankly, he will not ride on his enemy. The flesh cannot support God's work. Mm -mm. The flesh has an interest and it is continuously anti-face with the interest of Jesus. So if any man will be useful to God, this enemy within must be evacuated, must be abolished. So when we preach the gospel that does not point men to the death, ah, we have not preached. We have not. And we are not raising a congregation that can be used of God. I know our forefathers, this was their specialization. This, they preached this. They emphasized it. They sang it. But as our own generation came over, somehow, the enemy, and it's the enemy within. I want to tell you, I don't even think so much that it's the devil. It's the flesh. The flesh? Do you think he would like to die? So this moment, if God is saying, I'm doing a new thing, that new thing that God is doing requires that this thing that Jesus came to Calvary to do, we need to embrace it, we need to accept it, we need to receive it, we need to stand and say, yes, Lord, the enemy within me has to go. Again, let me ask you, what will you pay for it? What will you pay for it? It's settled. All you need to do is to come and say, Lord, I have carried an enemy inside for many years. It made me to pretend it made me to put up a good appearance, but my inner man is not correct. This enemy inside almost finished my marriage because he, he keeps insisting, no way here. The enemy within is what has destroyed what could have been the glory of God. The enemy within has retarded my progress. But for it, for this reason, the Bible said, Jesus took upon him the flesh and blood that he might taste death for every man. That death he died, according to Colossians, was to abolish this enemy. And in verse 23, he now concludes... If indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you had, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, became a minister. When we come back, I will be talking to you about genuine ministry. What is the ministry that will bring revival? What is the ministry? We are not too many here. Listen, we are not too many in this hall. But I do not think we are too small for God to walk. Do you know that what became the great revival 
under Wesley, what they call Wesleyan Revival, that swept the whole of England, started with two brothers who decided that they were tired of hypocrisy. And they began to cry to God. How can we experience the sanctification of our lives? That was their cry. And on one blessed day, God came for them. Their lives changed. John Wesley was thoroughly converted. And from this point, the Methodist revival that swept all of England started in their parlor. I want to say as we pray together that we are not many in this, in this meeting. We aren't. I have seen meetings that are bigger than this 100 times. Are you getting me? But as far as I can see God, we are not too small for God to spark a fire. Do you know that the fire that will burn a whole city does not need to be a big fire. It starts with what? Just a spark. Just like that. Just a spark is enough. And can I inform you, even that spark does not have to spark on everybody. It can only begin with one man who remains unquenchable. It will spread. Maybe you say, I'm the only one from my congregation. There's no problem about that. Let something happen with you here. It will be sufficient to turn the land. Don't say, but I am not significant. Fire does not depend on significance. It only depends on burning. Do you understand? Once a stick of matches catches fire. It's not a significant anything, but because it has catch it, it caught fire and is burning, and only came near something that is ignitable, it burns that. That's all. They say, what, what, what brought this fire here? They will look and they say, oh, it is only this little stick. Do you know God can make you that little stick? God can set our community ablaze because he got you. We're going to pray together on this. We're going to respond to God. In this kind of meeting, I want you to please. We came all the way. We came all the way. We came all the way. If God does not want to do something, I don't think God is so uneconomical. No, he doesn't waste anything. The Jesus I have been studying does not waste anything. When he fed 5,000, do you remember fragments? He told them, say, gather the fragments. I was very touched when he used the word gather. He didn't say sweep. If he said sweep, when you sweep fragments, can you use it again? It's wasted. But he didn't use the word sweep. He said gather, which means and pick. Pick them and put them in the basket. I can't see God wasting this weekend. I can't see God wasting your money to travel here. I can't see God wasting your time. I can see him starting a fire. And it will begin with me. Will it begin with you? Let's pray together. Please stand with me in prayer. Let's pray together. Thank you, Father. Lord, thank you. Hallelujah, Father. Lord, thank you. I'd like you to please feel free to call on God. All I have been doing this morning, we're just studying the word of God. We're studying the gospel. We're studying the uniqueness of our faith. The uniqueness of Christ. What makes him unique? We have talked about the blood of the cross. By which everything on earth and everything in heaven will be reconciled back to fellowship. 
But this point we are noting. Why we believe in the blood, why we come under the blood, why we come under the shower, unless we deal with the enmity within, it will continue to nullify whatever we are doing. Would you like to present yourself, Lord? If you went to Calvary for me, I don't want to have anything less than what you died to offer me. Please pray. Please pray. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Father, this afternoon, reach out to us in a definite way. Reach out to me, Lord, in a definite way. Cause me to see the man of Calvary again. Cause me to see the work you did. In order to locate me properly in that which you have asked me to do for you. If zeal was sufficient for what we are talking about, I would have told you to be zealous. But you know that the enemy between inside does not mind your being zealous. He comes anytime he likes to destroy whatever you have been putting together. Will you present yourself to the Lord this moment and say, Lord, here am I. Spark a fire with me. Start something with me. You say you want to do a new thing and that now will it spring forth. Lord, set me ablaze. That thing that you came to abolish, let it not find a space anymore within my own life. I'm coming to you, Lord. Please pray. Please pray. Two questions I want you to please respond to God about. For the sins that you have committed, brother, sister, the blood is available to take it away. It will blot it out. It will cleanse you completely and there will be no evidence of it left. You don't have a reason to go out of this meeting without a cleansing. You don't need to pay for it. You only need to come. But beyond that, the enmity within, the rebel inside, the one that makes you do the things you don't want to do. That always opposes the motion of the spirit within you. Jesus went to Calvary to abolish it. Release it and say, Lord, your death must become my experience. I don't want to go out of this retreat struggling anymore. I must lay it at the foot of the cross. I want to lay it at your feet now. I want to lay it at your feet. I want an evacuation where you will live your own life within me. Oh, Jesus. Let me suggest to you, don't struggle about it. God is not demanding your struggle. Is demanding a simple surrender in faith. He tasted death for that enemy within to be abolished. Don't defend it. He's your enemy. So my, he appears as if he's, he's, he's the one that is defending you. No. He's only there to destroy you. Release it. Release it. Jesus died so he can abolish it. Don't go out of this meeting with it. Lay it down. Lay it down. With a simple prayer. I want you to simply come to that end this morning and say, Lord, it's not by struggle. 
It's not by human effort. I've done that for years. I've struggled. I couldn't make it. It's not by religious observance. I have tried that. I've remained a mere struggler. But this morning or this afternoon, I look at the man of Calvary. And I say, that which you came to abolish can no longer stand within me. As I accept your work on the cross, I accept the death you died as sufficient to finish this man within. Cause me to know a newness of your life. An exchange of the man of God within. Christ, take over from me now. Just a simple prayer of faith. Stop struggling. Just lay it down. Thank you, Lord. Before I pray now, and yet you know the, the, the secret of this is that he will not force it on you. He will wait for you to say, I am tired of carrying this enemy within me. I am tired. I lay it down. I don't want to explain it away anymore. I lay it down. Let this weekend actually mark the turning point I've been looking for for this number of years. If you want to do that, and deeply, deeply in your heart, you want to do it. I would like you to do it. By just lifting your two hands to God, I surrender. I want you to take your place. I want to see the cross walking within me. Producing what you went to Calvary to get. I want the man inside who opposed your work in me for years. I want it abolished. I want it abolished. I want a release so that I can carry you properly from here. Thank you. Thank you.